We just got our first question. We are recording this, and then we're going to be sending out PDFs of this presentation for you guys. If you have any, if you want to reference it in the future, we're going to send that after the presentation, though. <laughs> we, we actually do have a YouTube channel right now. State Supply YouTube, if you guys want to check it out. All right, we're going to give it about one more minute. All right, looks like it is time to begin. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Marshall Powers with State Supply. This is gonna be our pump fundamentals and hydronic system basics presentation. It is kind of a two-part presentation with just beginner information in there. And then we have a little bit of hands-on stuff towards the end of each. So about halfway through, we'll have a break and then we are gonna announce we have two winners uh, for we have picking out gift cards. We're doing Amazon gift cards. The first winner we'll announce at the break. That will be a $50 gift card. And then if you guys make it till the end, which I hope you do, we're going to hand out a $100 gift card. We're just going to email those to the email that you signed up with. So this presentation, it's, it's nice and basic. And we're just kind of going over general concepts. So hydronics and pumps are one and the same. So we're gonna start with hydronics and then we're gonna get a little more deeper into the, the pump fundamentals. And to keep things rolling, if you could save your questions till the end, if you type it into the Q&A tab, if you're on the Zoho platform, you can just type in your questions and then we'll track those. And then at the end of the presentation, we will respond to those. So don't think that we're ignoring you. We just want to keep things rolling because some people, you know, may be busy today. So without further ado, so I just want to give a little overview on, you know, who is State Supply. We're located in Fridley, Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we just had snow yesterday, so it's still cold up here. We've been in the business for almost 90 years supporting maintenance professionals. We offer parts and support for steam and hydronic heating systems. We have some hands-on training in-house and on-site. We also have a YouTube channel where we give some repair tips on specific things that we sell. And we have specialists that have been in the business for a long time. So if you have any parts that are obsolete or are really hard to find, or you're having trouble finding the serial IDs on them, uh, give us a call and we can help out with that. So those are some of the brands that we carry. All right, so I'm Marshall Powers. I've been with State Supply a couple of years now. I've been in, I've been, I'm a mechanical engineer. Cole and I actually went to the same school. We both went to Mankato State in Minnesota. We both have a uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I enjoy fishing, barbecuing, camping, and there's the, the first muskie I caught this past summer. And I'm Cole Angel. Um, like you said, I also went to Mankato. I have a mechanical engineering degree and i am a minnesota native who loves the vikings fishing going to the cabin and i've been with state supply for just over 10 months now and to all the attendees today if you're having any issues with the audio uh please let us know if you could just type in the q a tab so we can get that addressed on our end everything sounds good so please let us know 
And the guy you've all been waiting for, this is Tom Kevorkian. This is our in-house pump doctor. And he's, he's been on our YouTube channel for 10 plus years now. He's very knowledgeable. He's been in the business for 37 years. For 14 years, he's been a, a B&G Bell & Gossett rep. So if you have any questions specific to B&G pumps, uh, please let us know and he will be able to help you out. He has tons of infield experience. So it's great to reference him. He's also from Minnesota. And if you guys have questions, we have the slide number on the bottom right hand side. And if you could reference that, so then with your question, then at the end, it'll, it'll be easier for us to go back to that slide. So here we're getting into our part one for our hydronics. So I'm just gonna read through some of these objectives. We wanna identify the main components of a hydronic system. We're gonna go over the main parts in centrifugal pumps. And we wanna understand the universal hydronics formula and how pumps are sized. Next, we're gonna go over general rules of piping a pump, understanding water quality and its importance to maintaining your system, looking out for Legionnaire's disease, and then we're gonna go over some common repair items. So first let's start off from a base level. What is a hydronic system? So hydronic just refers to water being the medium that is heated. It's gonna be heated in the boiler, right? That's, that's the heat source. And this water is circulated via pumps throughout the piping network. And we're transferring some of that heat that's contained in that water inside the radiator to outside space if we're just doing simple space heating. So the heat exchangers displace the heat, pumps move or circulate the water, and the boiler is heating the water. And it's important to note, these are used in residential as well as commercial settings. Some of the benefits for a hydronic system, they have really high energy efficiency, especially compared to a steam system, and they have good life cycle costs when compared to forced air. Something else to note too, is that more and more new buildings that pop up are actually using hydronic systems. So they have a lot of high adoption rates. So you have a lot of availability and support. Uh, people are getting really good at understanding these systems and their benefits. One benefit is zoning capability. So if you have different rooms and someone likes it one temperature, the other person likes it the other, you can adjust that easily with the hydronic system. They're very quiet and reliable. So like here in our building, when our, when our air turns on, you can hear the ducts uh, rattling and making a lot of noise. Uh, you don't have that issue with hydronic systems. So that's definitely a benefit. And besides that, you don't have uh, spread in germs and contaminants. Like I just had the ducts uh, blown out in my house and you get, you get a lot of debris and buildup, but you're not going to get that. It's not going to, with hydronic systems that will transfer to the air. And another really cool thing, especially live in a cold climate is you can do in-floor heating. So who doesn't like getting out of a bathroom and stepping on a nice, uh, nice warm floor. Otherwise you can keep the snow off your driveway. Hey Marshall, uh, oh, we yeah. have a comment saying my audio is bad. Is it yeah, bad on you? your end? It's a little little spotty. Why don't you pop your headphones off and then see how it sounds there? Here, I'll change it to my computer one second. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's that sounds a lot better. Okay, we'll go with that. Sorry about that. Okay, so here we have the boiler. This is going to be the main source for the heat in your system. And water is heated up by either burning a fuel or electricity. And then typically it's going to be the most expensive piece of equipment in your hydronic system. And for safety, we have low water cutoffs and safety relief valves. And then here we're going to discuss heat exchangers a little bit. And by heat exchanger, we mean anywhere where heat is transferred from one source to another. So the faster that water is cycled through, the less heat will actually be transferred. So a slower moving water can actually be beneficial or more passes through a heat exchanger. Materials for heat exchangers work best if they're conductive to allow more heat to pass through in less time. 
And one big advantage to heat exchangers is that there's no physical contact between fluids, which means there's no contamination, which is really helpful in process and food instances. And then common types of heat exchangers are going to be the shell and tube, plate and frame, and PEX tubing. And then we're also going to discuss pumps a little bit. So pumps create a pressure differential by giving the fluid velocity with the impeller. And that energy is then converted into pressure from the volute. So head of the pump versus head of the system. We're just going to discuss quick. The head of the pump is the pressure differential from the inlet and outlet of the pump caused by that pump. The head of the system will change and is, well, the head of the system is a curve and it's actually a constant curve. And the pump and the head of the system, their two curves will meet and that will be the operating point of the system. And that operating point can move by adjusting either the system or by changing the speed of the pump. So pumps are also known as circulators for low pressure applications or booster pumps for high higher pressure applications. However, they're just terminology and not necessarily concrete definitions for either. Pumps are sized off of their head and flow rate and different styles of pumps are used depending on the system and larger systems can use base mounted pumps, for instance, and smaller pumps can use inline pumps. So the common types of pumps in our industry are positive displacement on the left hand side and then the centrifugal on the right hand side. So we're going to go over there's those next here. So positive displacement, it moves a fixed amount of liquid at a time through. So it kind of uh, trans transports or pushes the fluid in cycles. And examples of these are gear, screw and piston. And this, you know, you're going to use these if you have a really viscous fluid like ink or just something, something thicker like a slurry. So it's, it's useful in those applications. Whereas a centrifugal pump, it, it's the most common. That's what I mostly see out in the field. It's a continuous flow. So whatever enters the pump is exiting at equal rates. So as Cole went over, it works by increasing the fluid velocity and some of that velocity is, is transformed into a pressure differential, which allows it to overcome the head of the system to induce flow. So it's really good for mid and low viscosity fluids. If you have something with a lot of particulate, it may not handle it very well. And here we're gonna look at some different impeller types. I'm sure most of you probably seen the most common, which is the closed one. Um, and that's the bottom left. So the, the impeller is the portion of the pump that's rotating, you know, along with the motor. So it transfers the kinetic energy to the fluid. And the most common materials are bronze, stainless steel, cast iron, and plastic. And the material type is going to depend on your application. If you have something that's you know, really acidic, then you might have to go with something like stainless or plastic. Um, so it all depends on the application, but bronze is going to be your most common. So if we look at the different impeller types, the close on the bottom left, that's going to be your most efficient, but at the same time, it's not going to be able to handle particulate very well. So if you have a lot of particulate, you might want something like the semi open in the middle otherwise the fully open but as you open the impeller up it loses that that base you're going to lose efficiency as well here we're going to discuss the volute and the purpose so the volute is defined by the area around the impeller inside of the pump and the purpose is to convert the kinetic energy which is in the form of velocity produced by the impeller into potential energy or pressure. So pressure is really just another type of energy. Higher pressure has more energy. The difference between the suction and discharge pressures show the increase in pressure the pump has achieved. And then mechanical seals. So they create a seal between the shaft and the pump while maintaining minimal friction loss. So it consists of the rotating components which is going to be like the carbon side of the seal and such. 
and then a spring and some secondary elements. The fixed part is the ceramic part of the seal with the boot. And with these, it's important to avoid touching the steel faces if your hands are dirty or if they're greasy at all. And then drive assemblies. So closed coupled pumps do not require a coupler as the impeller is actually mounted on the motor shaft. And typically these are gonna be used for relatively smaller applications. While frame mounted split coupled pumps use bearings and a coupler, which the coupler can actually be used often as a sacrificial component, which is used when it's misaligned. So with these frame mounted split coupled pumps, you, pumps, you actually have to align the two shafts. Otherwise it can cause vibrations reducing component life. And that's where shaft alignment comes into play. And you can align shafts using a straight edge, a dial indicator, or using laser alignment tools. Here we're going to go over how to size a pump for a given room or building. And this is something that everyone should know that works in hydronics. It's a universal hydronics formula. So I don't know, hopefully everyone can see my cursor, but just GPM equals VTUH divided by delta T times 500. So this is a good equation to just understand, you know, to figure out what pump you need to heat your room or your rooms, excuse me. So GPM is the required flow rate and BTUH is the heat loss from the building or space. And that's gonna be determined by things like the R value of the walls, uh, the size of the room or the building, how many windows you have. And that's gonna be, you're gonna to wanna to heat the building based off the worst day or the coldest day of the year, which for us this year was, what did we hit? Uh, 20, 22 below zero without wind chill, something like that. <laughs> so in the Delta T, depending on the type of system, if it's a baseboard or a radiator, uh, it's typically designed at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the temperature drop that you're gonna see when it leaves the boiler and when it comes back in. And so once you get that, the, the 500 is actually a constant and that has to do with the weight of water. So if you have glycol in there, that 500 will get lowered, so you'll need to adjust that. But once you have basically your, your heat loss determined, you can uh, size your, your pump properly. It looks like we have a question here. Someone um, lost audio. I, I still have audio. Uh, audience members, please confirm if you've lost audio or yay or nay. So it is still working for most, it looks like. Maybe try relaunching if it's still not working. Yeah, yeah. I think anonymous attendee, if you do have issues with your audio, please uh, exit out of the webinar and try to relaunch it. It looks like other people uh, do have audio. So we're gonna continue on. Let us know if you still have that issue. So calculating the head. And this is an important thing, it's, it does get confusing. So we have our image on the left there, and this is for an open system. And a lot of people mistakenly think that the head of the system is just the height of the building. So if you have to uh, move, your, you know, move your water from ground level to four stories up, it's gonna be whatever that height difference is. And that's, that's not always the head. So it may be a factor. So simple things to keep in mind for an open system, it's going to be your friction losses plus your static head, and you just combine the two. So the friction losses are going to be dependent on the material, the pipe, uh, the valves that you have, elbows, all those things come into play because as the water liquid passes over that, it's having that dynamic friction loss that the pump needs to overcome that head and push past. And then your static head for an open system is actually going to be the, the height difference. So in this case, you're moving the liquid from zero feet up 60 feet. And it's open because it is open to ambient conditions. So it's not, it's not sealed off. And then for a closed system, your friction loss is simply equal your head loss. And then there's, there's different charts and tabulated values that you can actually get good estimates 
for the friction losses that your pump is going to experience. All right, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm just gonna read through a couple of these. These are general rules of piping a pump. And let's see here. The first one is just make sure you have a straight run of pipe equal to five, 10, ten times the pipe diameter. And this is just to allow the flow to develop. So the last thing you wanna do is have an abrupt 90 degree angle leading right into your pump and then having the flow not develop properly and then it unevenly loads the impeller. And then I'm just gonna read one more and because it's a lot to read off. Ensure the piping arrangement does not cause strain on the volute. So you wanna make sure that your pipe is supported separate from your pump. So like, again, we're gonna send this out in PDF if you wanna reference this. Here, we're just gonna discuss two valves quickly. Uh, so check valves are gonna be very common on a system, especially for residential homes, usually to the main line, they will have a check valve. Um, so the idea is that they only allow flow to go in one direction. And the picture shown is a swing or valve. So when water flows to the right, it will open the swinging part of the valve. And then if water tries to backflow, it will slam it shut. Another very common type of valve uh, that's a check valve is going to be your spring-loaded check valve. And it is loaded with the spring so that the resistance when water goes over it will open the valve and then it wants to stay shut if water is flowing backwards. Another common type is going to be a mixing valve. So they mix hot and cold water to a desired temperature. So these are going to be used for like when you're taking a shower, for instance, or in public, the sinks are required to have mixing valves to a certain spec. And another type of valve that you're gonna see a lot is like isolation valves and stuff. And here we're just gonna talk about some zoning. So valves versus multiple circulators. There's two different schools of thought on this. And there's not necessarily a correct answer. Both of them work and people argue for both sides on this. Um, but we'll just go over some advantages and disadvantages of each. So zone valves are cheaper initially because you're not buying multiple circulators. And they also use less electricity because you're gonna have one circulator doing the entire zone. If you use like an ECM for instance, it's gonna save quite a bit of electricity. Uh, and then on the other side, using multiple circulators, multiple pumps will offer redundancy. So if you lose one pump in your system, you might lose one branch of that system, or it's possible that the other pumps in the circuit can actually make up for that and still run water through there. So pumps tend to be much more reliable than zone valves. And then we're also going to discuss radiant heat manifolds. So if you like your heated floors, um, this is typically what you're going to be using. And it changes the flow to each line in the system by changing the resistance. And it's used to balance systems. And this allows adjustments to be made to different heating locations. So if you wanted one garage floor to be warmer than the other, for instance, you could do that. Or you can also add zones after the fact, and then you can rebalance them. Water quality is a really important thing that does not get enough attention. And if you look at the image on the left there, there's a small pinhole leak from corrosion. And good water quality is going to ensure long life for your system and avoid component breakdown. You know, what are some things that affect water quality? Well, uh, one big one is the pH of the water, and that should be kept between 8 and 10.5. And that pH will fluctuate over time, especially based off the chemicals that you put into it. What else affects water quality? You get buildup from dirt and debris, and then your total dissolved solids, which is the mineral content. So the main thing that I want people to remember is poor water quality equals high cost and downtime. So we've been to places that have had uh, a lot of failures where they had just replaced something, a pump or, or whatever it was, and then it fails two years later. And then we ask them, you know, how's your water quality? And then, then it comes out that, oh, our water quality is terrible. 
sometimes you can't always do things to fix your water quality, but you can, you should be able to improve it significantly. A cool thing to keep in mind is for every 20 degree rise in temperature, the corrosion rate doubles. So, you know, how are we going to improve quality? Well, you can drop chemicals in your system and this can descale and remove debris from the system and prevent corrosion and scale buildup. So what's the problem with scale or corrosion? Well, the main purpose of the hydronic system is we're transferring heat from the water to through a, a heat exchange device to the surrounding air. So if you have, if you have your pipe and then you have buildup that starts to accumulate on the inside, that heat transfer efficiency is going to go down, which we don't want. So you can test the pH using uh, test strips, which are really cheap. And something the boiler operators would know is uh, you want to, the, you want to keep your pH in a certain range. So the boilers will actually specify that range for the pH. And if you're outside that range and you have a failure, you're often going to avoid your, avoid your warranty, which is obviously a bad thing. So you want to measure it upon installation and at least once a year, the pH will drop over time. It will become more acidic. So another uh, cool device is the magnetic separators. And this just removes the corrosive byproducts uh, from your system. And then it's usually something easy where you can just unscrew it and then rinse or, or dump out and get all that uh, build up out of there. And then the next option is just a simple strainer. But if you have a strainer, you got to make sure you blow it down and you clear it out. If you let the strainer get gunked up and full, then it's not going to be able to uh, filter anything out. And lastly, you can demineralize the water and the mineralization of the water is measured by the TDS. But if you have a probe style uh, water cut off in your boiler, you have to have some uh, TDS. You have to have some minerals in that water for it to detect where the water level is. So it's going to depend on your system. How do we prevent freezing? And this, this relates to chillers that are on rooftops if they they go outside and the main way to do that is through dumping glycol on your system that's going to lower the temperature at which your water is going to freeze so the amount of glycol is going to depend and glycol isn't cheap especially if you're flushing out your boiler you're going to have to re-add in the glycol so it all depends on your system we have safety some safety concerns and this is more for the residents of like uh, an apartment building or uh, kids in a school and this has to do with Legionnaires disease. So Legionella is a bacteria that forms in stagnant water and I would call it warm water and in high enough concentrations and people with lowered immune systems it can cause Legionnaires disease which has some nasty some nasty symptoms that go along with that. So the key to preventing it is you want to keep your hot water hot and your cold water cold. You can also add some chemicals. And the main reason that we want to avoid this, obviously you want to, you want to keep people, you want to keep your tenants uh, safe and healthy, but also from a financial side is lawsuits. There's just go on Google and check out lawsuits for Legionnaires disease. And it happens all the time and no one wants to get mixed up in that. Then right before the break, we have maintenance items for your hydronic system. So the pump motor and seal kit are pretty common repairs, or at least often enough to repair parts. Um, bearing lubrication, this is going to depend on your pump a lot. Uh, some pumps don't need are quote unquote maintenance free, uh, while others need to be lubricated every so often, sometimes every quarter. Uh, system leaks and scale buildup. So if you're losing a lot of water, obviously it has to be going somewhere. And typically that's going to be due to a leak and scale buildup can again, reduce your efficiencies. Uh, mixing valves should be checked annually and cleaning soot from the combustion chamber of hydronic system heaters should also be done annually. And this is one of those things that a lot of people don't do. And it often shortens their lifespan of their heaters significantly. Uh, the recommendation is that the system should be flushed every five years or more often. And 
bleeding air from the system, for instance, if you have radiators or wherever else you're able to bleed air from, will help the system operate more efficiently. All right, so we have a break now. Thanks for staying tuned. We're just going to take a quick five minute break. If, some, if anyone's got to use the bathroom, get some water, we'll do that. And then in the meantime, Should we, I'm going to go. There ahead. is one question Daniel had. Um, what do you mean by these? Is the spiral the same application? And then he said spiral tank. You could clarify. And then, yes, we have to do the giveaway. Yeah. When looking at clear water, how often do I? Okay, let's see. When looking at clearing water, Marshall, do you spiral tank? Um, was this on the water quality? Yeah, let me go back through. Is there a uh, which slide are you referring to? 27. We're, we're looking at the spiral tank. Same application. Let's see here. Spiral tank. I thought he was referring to slide 27, which is water quality. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Um, Oh, yeah, look at the cleaning the water. So is the spiral tank the same application? So basically, I'll try to answer your question. Inside this magnetic separator, it's just a magnet. And as ferrous material that's in the water passes through it, the magnet attracts that ferrous material. And there's actually videos uh, that if you go on Tako's YouTube channel, that you can see the magnetic separator in action. So once there's a lot of buildup from there, you just unscrew um, it and then you can get rid of all that, that buildup there. And then and the then, next question, I got, yeah. The next okay. question from Michael, how often do I oil the pump? Uh, it's gonna depend on the pump, the IOM that should come with the pump. It's gonna depend on the bearings, what kind of bearings you have, but just the fact that you're thinking about oiling the pumps a good thing. So if you have, if you're noticing any like heat buildup or your bearings have failed, then there's obviously a lack of oil with that. Um, if, if it's a bearing that should be oiled uh, or lubricated with grease, uh, it should be added Every, every so often, however often you decide it, whether it's quarterly or whatever. And okay. you should add it until it gurgles. Tom? It, it, when it comes to oil, uh, it usually, if it's a sleeve bearing uh, assembly, uh, usually the oil is done pre-heat season. And then about halfway through your heating season, you check it again. And that's for heating only, obviously. This isn't for a pump that runs 365 days a year. And then let's do one last question before we announce the giveaway winner. And then, uh, Tom, if you could help us out on this one as well. If the entire system for the school is filled with glycol, how often should we flush the system and start over with fresh glycol? Well, you know, in, in today's day and age, technically, if it ain't broke, don't fix it is what they say. Um, it's it's based on, again, you go back to water quality, your pH levels, um, how much air is getting into the system. I mean, technically, you're not supposed to flush glycol systems. That, you know, there's supposed to be a lifetime thing there. So, I mean, flushing, no. Maintaining, yes. I don't know if that answers the question, right? I think it does. Thank you, Tom. Uh-huh. Okay. So, I have the gift card winners. I'll announce the first one. Um, and the first winner is David Legat. Congratulations. Okay. Um, All right, and, we're gonna get, oh, go ahead. Uh, if, uh, Esme will reach out to you, David, and get your details for that gift card. Like, 
Go ahead, Marshall. Sorry. Okay. No, no. Thanks for sticking with us. So we're going to jump into our second half, which is pumps. And then any other questions, uh, Ron, I know you asked a question, so we will get to that at the end of the presentation, if you wouldn't mind sticking with us. So the next half is about 30 minutes or so. Uh, so this one has to do with pumps. And as I said before, pumps and hydronics are one in one. We just felt that it was good to go a little bit more in depth with pumps. So here we're gonna go over the objectives. We wanna understand the purpose of the pump and its basic operating principles. We're gonna go over different types and the advantages to each. We're gonna look at cavitation and other issues that cause premature failure in your pump. And then we're gonna go over some real world issues, get into some, some live stuff. And lastly, we'll go over, Cole's gonna go over how to select a pump and reading a pump curve. Okay, so here we have a basic centrifugal pump and its components. Um, so this is a split coupled pump. So on the left hand side, there's the coupling which attaches to the motor. And then we work our way over towards the bearings and this will help take torsional stress off the shaft so that the shaft does not bend and have to take all the weight. Uh, the seal is then used to keep water from leaving the volute and air from entering the volute when the system shut off. And then at the top, there's the discharge where the water leaves, the suction to the right, and the volute again is the inside where the impeller sits. Here we're gonna go uh, over just some, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I, oh, sorry, my bad. Good, okay. Closed couple pump versus a split couple pump. So the closed couple, the impeller is mounted directly onto the motor shaft. And so it's typically gonna be smaller applications. It's gonna be lower, lower flow, lower head. Uh, you don't need alignment for those, which is really nice. And then on the right, we have our split coupled, which is gonna need a coupler involved to transfer the force from the motor to the uh, pump shaft. And these are good for handling larger loads. You have more choices because you can mix and match your motors with those. They typically have longer lifespans, uh, but they do need alignment. So the different types of centrifugal pumps and for all these types, well, for the, you know, the first, first two there, it's really dependent on preference. You'll find that a lot of these pumps can cross over to the other pumps operating range for head and flow. So it might be due to a size constraint, how the existing piping is laid out that will dictate which pump you're gonna select. So the first one is our end suction, and that's just the discharge uh, and suction are gonna be at a 90 to one another. And those are the most common. The inline is typically smaller, um, and that just means the suction and the discharge are on the same axis. And next we have split case, which is really good for maintenance. So you don't have to pull it out, line, out of line and it requires a low uh, net positive suction head. Next we have our multi-stage, which just means that you have multiple impellers stacked up in series to one another and which each, with each impeller, you have the pressure differential uh, getting doubled roughly. So they can achieve a lot higher pressures. Uh, and lastly, we have the self-priming pump, which you don't have to prime that pump. So some piping, you know, different ways to pipe up these pumps. So the first one we have is series. And if you have two identical pumps in series, the flow stays the same, but the pressure doubles. And with parallel, which is the bottom right, the, uh, the pressure stays the same, but the flow actually doubles. And I like parallel pumping because it's just providing an extra pump in case one fails. And it could be a lot easier maintenance since you can just shut the valves off and just isolate one and then work on it. So that with parallel pumps, you just have a lead leg, which is very common, especially if it's in a critical application, you don't wanna have one pump go down and then you have to shut your whole system off. So with the parallel, you can have one in lead running and then one in leg and standby. 
and it increases the pump life. And then if you have a surge in capacity, it'll, it'll help meet that. And then here, the alternative to a mechanical steel is packing material. Uh, so it's not as common as mechanical steels, and they're typically the older style of steel. And it has a very similar application, or same use case actually. And it prevents water from leaking from the pump and air from entering. However, you do get some leakage for the steel to actually work. And typically it's a braided rope with a square cross section with a synthetic graphene impregnation, graphite or graphene actually. Um, and then pump shaft alignment. So if you have a split coupled pump uh, shown on the left, for instance, uh, you need to align the pump before actually using it. And typically you need to realign the pump every time the pump is moved or the shaft is taken apart. Uh, this can be done with a straight edge or versatile indicator or a laser tool. And it will cause vibrations and reduce component life if done poorly. And then couplings. So spider coupling is the older style, which is shown on the bottom left. And then the Woods, and Sureflex, and Duraflex elastomeric couplers are the new normal. And you will also see spring couplers as well on some smaller applications. Cavitation is something that can cause your pump to fail prematurely. And if you've ever had cavitation, uh, you might have experienced it with, it sounds like gravel going through the pump. So it's really loud. If you just go on YouTube and type in pump cavitation, you can hear it for yourself. It sounds pretty nasty and it will cause your pump to fail quickly. But basically what it is, uh, when you select a pump, you need to have a certain amount of net positive suction head so that your pump does not cavitate. So when the water, you know, it comes in through the eye of the, the impeller, which is the center, which we have the blue bubbles here. If that pressure gets low enough, by definition, water boils according to its pressure. So if you drop that pressure enough, you'll get rapid boiling for that water. And then as it moves out along those veins, it will implode quickly and release all that energy. And then it'll explode even on a bronze impeller and it'll cause pitting. So cavitation is something you want to avoid. Like here's a picture of an impeller. You can see it's pretty drastic, but there, there's your pitting. And then if you notice abnormal sounds, vibrations, rocks or gravel running through, then you know you probably have cavitation. The solutions to improve that are increasing your upstream pressure. And then you can add an inducer at the inlet. Um, so if you have uneven load coming onto your impeller, the, then you can unevenly load it and it cause vibrations and issues. So an inducer helps uh, stabilize that flow. And then the other option is just to turn your pump down. Some other common issues, we have a lot of, if you look inside that volute, you have a lot of, a lot of build up there. It doesn't look good. <laughs> so if you have incorrect sizing and improper use, a lot of times people may say that, well, your pump isn't working, even if it's a brand new pump, when in reality, maybe the pump wasn't sized appropriately to begin with. That, that happens a lot. A lot of people over pump, which leads to issues and you're operating the pump at a much uh, a less efficient point than it should be, which means it'll fail faster. And then you get corrosion. If you have things that aren't meant to mix together, you'll get more corrosion. And then if you don't watch your water quality, you'll get more buildup. And you just want to make sure that your water is clean and mixed properly. And then every once in a while, maybe you need to clean the pump. And then here we're going to just discuss priming the pump. Um, so priming is the act of filling the pollute with liquid. Um, so it's needed before the pump is started. Otherwise, you will damage the seal kits and some other components inside of the pump. Uh, so lack of priming can be a cause for cavitation or again, damage to the pump. And then pump performance monitoring. So if you are trying to maintain a system, you should be checking the following. The suction and discharge pressure of the pump, 
and you should be noting these down so that if it changes, you can see that either something in the system has gone bad or the pump has gone bad or the system has changed. Uh, so just by monitoring the suction and discharge pressure, sometimes you can notice if, for instance, if there's scale buildup in the system and there's a lot more pressure than there should be and the pump has to work harder, you can see that. So along with that is the pump speed and the motor load. Using those uh, numbers, you will be able to tell if something's going wrong with your system. And now we're going to talk about pump curves. So pump curves are very simple and powerful once you understand them. And it shows a trade-off between head and flow, so pressure and the flow. And the incorrect sizing, um, incorrect sizing is a very common issue in the industry. People just oversize everything. They go, oh, well, it will work. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best pump for that job. Um, so pumps may only operate on the curve. So the curve off to the right here, for instance, might be some sort of typical pump. And the pump cannot operate below that curve to the right of the curve or above that curve. It has to operate on that curve and it will do that based off of the head. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the line ends near three gallons per minute. And if you run the pump at a lower head than it looks like one is the corresponding head. The pump will, it will pump too much and actually damage itself. So to understand pump curves, we're gonna use that first one. And now we're gonna look at this pump curve. So the only difference between those two, other than the numbers, is we have different impeller sizes shown. So each line corresponds to different impellers. This is why we trim impellers so that we can operate at different points. Like we can get the point, the operating point we want by moving down. And changing speeds will do a very similar thing. So if you use a VFD, for instance, you're able to move inside of that top pump curve. So the next piece that we're gonna talk about on the pump curve is the NPSHR. So this is the net positive suction head requirement for cavitation did not happen. So with a higher flow rate, that increases. So you need to make sure that there's enough pressure at the inlet so that it doesn't begin cavitating and damage and shorten the lifespan of your pump. And then the next part is horsepower. So this is gonna have to do with the motor that goes along with the pump. And so the horsepower curve is the dotted line and it needs to be above and to the right of the curve you're operating on. So the 15 horsepower motor, for instance, can operate all the different impeller sizes. The 10 horsepower, you'd not want to use that for anything uh, greater than eight and a half inches. So you just, it's a different way to size, I guess, or you can get a smaller motor, which may operate, which is what you're going to want to do. And then finally, we have efficiency curves. So these are shown here. And the best operating point, best efficiency point, is where that little line is on the top. Marshall, can you put your mouse over it? Best yep. efficiency yep. point right, right there. Did my microphone change? You cut in a little out, but you're, you're good now. Hello? I can hear you. OK, weird. My headphones just turned off. Um, so the best efficiency point is that point, where the pump, it looks to be about 80% efficient. So if you operate further away from there, you're going to get more vibration, and the pump will operate less efficiently. So you're going to use more electricity for each uh, amount of water you move. So how, how do we control a pump? And we're getting towards the end here. The You can use a control valve, and that's just to control the amount, uh, throttle the amount of flow that the pump produces. Uh, next, you can use a variable speed drive to just speed up or slow down your pump. It's pretty efficient. And then you can connect it to your 
your building automation system, building management system. And then lastly, you can use just an ECM pump if it can fit that application. And ECM pumps are really nice. They're, the motor itself is really efficient, but they have different operating modes that you can set. And we actually have a video, a COVID a video on it, on this BNG uh, ECM pump. If you want to check that out, and it goes through the different operating points that allow this thing to operate so efficiently. So in conclusion, we went over the main components of a hydronic system, the boiler, the pump, the, the radiator, heat exchanger. We went over all the components of a centrifugal pump, understanding how to size a pump for using the universal hydronics formula, general good practices to pipe a pump, some water quality concerns, safety with Legionnaire's disease, some common maintenance items, and lastly, how to read a pump curve. So I hope everyone enjoyed this. I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to, to join us. We hope to do more of these in the future. Uh, we're gonna answer questions now, and then we have a survey we're gonna send out uh, after this presentation. If you could please fill that out, be honest. Uh, we can take the, the harsh criticism, so we'll try to get these better in the future. And then we're gonna mail out so we'll send an email of the presentation in PDF format. So uh, we're going to hit some questions out. And then if you guys want, check out our YouTube channel. We're getting that going again. Um, otherwise, if you're on the social media, check that out as well. May, I believe, is putting the survey link in the question box. Um, and we also need to announce our last winner. And that is Sean Smith. He has won a hundred dollar gift card. So thank you guys very much for attending. And we would like to open it for questions now. Uh, Sean Esme will reach out to you with the email you registered with. And if you guys have any questions about Bell and Gossett pumps or anything like that, we have Tom here as well to answer questions. Uh, Tom, do you want to join us? Sure, I'm here. <laughs> Tom, I, I, we had a question from Ron that we didn't answer about the mixing the different glycols. I'm not too familiar with that. Do you happen to know much about that? I mean, ethylene and propylene, is it in the question? Uh, he didn't he did. specify. Well, uh, you know, technically don't mix ethylene and, and propylene, that's for sure. Uh, don't use automotive glycol. At least from what I've been taught, there's petroleum. It's a petroleum-based glycol, so therefore it affects pump seals, et cetera. So, yeah, what I've seen, ethylene and propylene can be mixed, but it can hurt the heat transfer a little bit. So, uh, well, yeah, something like three percent or four percent of heat transfer. Yeah, you might just lose a few percentage points, but you can do it. It will not okay. hurt your system. It comes up with the hazard uh, side of it too. Uh, obviously, ethylene is quite a bit more hazardous than propylene. Any other so questions? You, yeah, propylene glycol is actually, I had some uh, coconut flakes, I was making some dessert, and propylene <laughs> glycol is in there. So good to know. And then fireball whiskey. I think it's sure in it everything. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Sean Smith. Uh, how do you test water quality, chems and solids? So I can start answering that one. Uh, you can test water quality using pH. You can use, test it using electronic. Uh, Marshall, can you help me out here? Uh, you, with the conductivity? Yeah. So chems and solids. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we don't, we're not out actually performing water quality tests. I know that uh, Culligan or whoever your local water rep is, they do more in-depth water testing. Obviously, a uh, uh, water treatment plant, they can come out. Sometimes you can contact them and have them test your water quality. But a nice thing to do is just to test your, test your pH. And then if you notice a lot of buildup and things like that, then you should address that. And I'm sure that there's well, there's certain chemicals. Oh, yeah, calcium buildup also, you know, particulates are the big thing, especially when you're using glycol also. 
the cleaner, the Any, better, obviously. Anything else, or are we good to end it? We'll, we'll wait around for another minute. There's no questions. Thank you guys for attending. Seeing any. Uh, I'll check YouTube. We have nothing there. Awesome. If you guys come yeah, up with any questions later, you can email us as well. Um, or just state supply in general, and we'll try to help you guys out. So thank you. We're good to sign off. I think so. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thank one. You.